Hey everyone, welcome to Move the Finish Line. I'm your host, April Nowlin, and if you're looking for a podcast that's authentic, unfiltered, that may make you laugh and might make you cry, you're in the right place. Get ready for an exciting ride with me and my guest as we share stories of resilience, restoration, and winning at life from everyday women. My goal is to encourage you to break through the barriers that are stopping you from chasing your purpose. All right, let's get ready to move the finish line. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Move the Finish Line. I am very excited about our topic today. We're going to be talking about marriage. And so uh, for those of you guys who know me, you know that my marriage journey is like a roller coaster. And so I am so excited to have Miss Lakeisha, Mrs. Lakeisha Townsell on the podcast today. Um, She is a life coach, guys. She is a wife. She is a mom. She is one of the biggest champions for marriage that I have ever met. She is also a champion for women. So welcome to the podcast, Lakeisha. Thank you. I am so glad glad you're here. here. So glad you're here. So take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So I just turned 45 years old. And listen, I love aging. I absolutely love aging. And I'll get into why I love aging probably a little later on. But um, born and raised in Ohio, um, in Cleveland, Ohio. I was born there and um, moved to a little small town in Ohio. Um, called Delaware, Ohio, a little country town. So like my elementary years were in the country. And then we moved to the city, to Columbus, um, and grew up there, grew up for the most part in a Christian home. And I say for the most part because uh, my mom, she was Christian. Uh, My dad, he was a deacon, but he was a Baptist deacon, which meant which meant that um, he did what he wanted to do. He came to church when he, when he wanted to. Um, he stayed drunk. And not that all deacons in the Baptist church stay drunk, but that was his, that was his thing. Um, but I had an interesting childhood. And um, what I can say now at 45 years old, looking back, that um, there was so much pain and uncomfortableness in my childhood, but that really has propelled me into purpose. Oh, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So purpose. Um, Purpose. One of the goals of Move the Finish Line is to help women to cultivate their purpose, to chase Mm -hmm. their purpose. Um, And it's funny that being in our 40s, I think, I feel like that's that season where you're, you're starting to rethink, like, am I really chasing my purpose? Am I really doing what God has called me to do? And so for you, um, marriage. So when I met you, um, we have a mutual, well, she's your aunt, I believe, and my friend, um, a lady named Barbara that goes to our church. And I remember her telling me years and years and years ago that her niece was coming um, to Arizona. And I mean, when I met you, your smile just like lit up. I think the porch of the church is where you met. (laughs) Um, And I just, you know, remembered you from that moment. And so um, when I think about marriage, I think about you because you talk about marriage a lot on social media. Um, You don't just talk about it. You share intimate things from your marriage. You share advice, um, you know, all these different things. And so today I want to talk about your marriage journey, because what we see now Mm -hmm. is not always what your marriage was. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So share with us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, so um, I'll go back to my childhood. Um, In my family, I really can't think of any healthy marriages Mm. that I was surrounded around. Um, As a matter of fact, like as a child, I don't even remember our family celebrating marriage. Like, you know, a lot of times you can think back maybe when you were a teenager that you went to a relative's wedding or something. I may have two in mind that I went to that I can remember, but even in my own household, because my, so my parents weren't married when they first had me. I went to school with, um, as Lakeisha, as, oh wait, see, then, you know, this is a shame. I got to think of what, what I was (laughs) in my last name. So I went to school. I remember starting kindergarten as Lakeisha, 
Caldwell. Mm. So Barbara Caldwell, you know, that's my aunt. Mm-hmm. So um, that was my mom's maiden name. So I started school as Lakeisha Caldwell. My parents were still, to, they were together though, right? So they, um, we all lived in the same house, but my parents hadn't married. So it wasn't until maybe I got to like the second grade that my parents actually married. And then maybe in the third grade that they changed my last name to my father's last name. Mm-hmm. So I was Lakeisha Sales. Uh, so I always thought that that was just strange. Then, you know, moving, um, you know, forward a few years, I ended up um, really you know, being concerned because my father was an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And with him being an alcoholic, um, he was not physically abusive, but If you are in any type of abusive relationship, you know, it doesn't have to be physical to really take a toll, a toll on you. So my mom ended up getting diagnosed with breast cancer. I was like 14. She was maybe around like um, 29 or something. She had me when she was 17. And um, my, my dad being an alcoholic, he just, I'm looking at this marriage dynamic, April, and it was not good. So there were times I remember being 14 and 15, like thinking I was upset with my mom because I didn't want her to stay. Mm -hmm. I wanted her to take my brother and I and go somewhere else. So my whole idea of marriage was, I was like really upset with my mom kind of taking the the unhappiness. Again, no physical abuse, but she was unhappy. You know, she would be crying. Um, you know, my dad was being an alcoholic. You know, there were all type of issues. Police all, all the time knocking on our door, like, oh, we found your husband. Or he was, you know, drinking and driving. And he was, you know, on the side of the road. Pulled, he had pulled his car over himself. But here he is. We're bringing him back home to you. He was just the weirdest setup. And so I'm looking at my mom when I'm 14 and I'm 15. And I'm like, Why? Mm -hmm. Why? Like, what is that? So that was my picture of a marriage, right? And I knew that I couldn't go all the way to the extreme with the attitude of like, I'm not taking no mess from no man. And, you know, I knew I couldn't go there, but I also Mm -hmm. knew that I needed to have some type of boundaries, Mm -hmm. right? So my marriage journey, I really engulfed myself into the church. I ended up, um, I had a son Um, my freshman year of college and um, I was not married. So I ended up dropping out of college, but um, to get to the marriage journey piece of it, I found a great church. It was a word church that really emphasized faith, family, and finance. Those Mm. were the three pillars that they emphasize. And I, I knew that I wanted to have a family. I knew I wanted to be a wife and experience that. But of course, all of what I had with understanding a wife and what I didn't like and appreciate in my mom and how she walked out that role in being a wife. Again, I was trying to make sure that I didn't go to the extreme. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Like, you know, We'll go to the extreme, like, there's no way I'm going to marry a man who even sips on wine because I dealt with a a man who knows my father was an alcoholic. So we'll go to those extremes. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily healthy. Like, you know, if you want to sip on the wine and, you know, that's fine. Right. But that's what we'll do. We'll do that as a coping mechanism, Mm -hmm. as a way of protection. So I was um, definitely well enough emotionally to know that I didn't want to go to those different far extremes. So the church that I was going to, they did so good at um, really just pouring out the word and teaching about family, teaching about marriage. And I remember saying, like, I'm ready to date. Yeah. I'm ready to date. I'm 25, 25, 26. So that, that could still be kind of young knowing that now I have a 25 a year old now. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> but um you know, I was like, I'm ready to date. So started off with um, dating. And when I started dating, I immediately started dating the man that I married. And it was rocky. Yeah, it was our dating experience um, was rocky. And I think part of it, I know part of it was because I was 25. He was 23. 
Ooh. So think about that. Tw- a 23-year-old young man. Mm-mm-mm. It's Mm-mm. funny you say that because um, like you, I grew up in a home with a drug addict. Mm -hmm. who dated addicts and alcoholics. And Mm -hmm. so um, even though I lived with my dad part of my life, and that was a pretty stable home, I lived with my mother, I think the first seven years and then off and on. So I feel like that was the life that shaped me, which was like you said, going to the extremes, right? And so for me, when I started dating, I went to the extreme. Okay. I was like, I'm not dating a man that's smarter than me. I'm not dating a man. Like, I don't need no man to take care of me. I don't need, yeah. <laughs> like, it yeah. was, it yeah. was ridiculous. So those extremes can play a, a role in your life. And then thinking about that age, right? So your mom had you at 17. My mom had me at 17. I think my dad was 19. And as I've gotten older, people have asked me like, oh, do you blame, you know, your family for different things that happen? I mean, your parents. And I think about this and I'm like, man, now what decision would I have had to made at 17 or 19 years old? They were 17 and 19. So when you say, you know, 25 and 23 at the time, you're the wisest person in the world, but you're 25 and 23 and you don't know nothing. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you meet yeah. this great man who do. is yeah. 23 years old. 23 what years happened old. next? So it was a, a rocky engagement. Um, you know, he was, we went to a, a church that probably was like 3,000 members mm. and it wasn't a lot and it was pretty young church. So we had maybe a handful of bachelors mm-hmm. in, the, in our age group, right? So there was this, you know, like um, a little bit of tension of um, oh, like you're taking the last bachelor kind of thing, Lakeisha. Like it was, some, you know, scandal, right? I guess, you know, mm-hmm. some, some, some scandal that was taking place. So we made it through that and it wasn't like so horrible, but it's still definitely what had me to pause to say, is this the right decision, right? Like, am I, am I marrying the right person? And, you know, I ended up having a a dream, going on a women's retreat and getting confirmation straight from the Holy Spirit. I needed to have the Holy Ghost confirmed because it was like, this is my life. And I have a little boy. I hadn't brought any other men around him. So it was like, I, I need to know that this is what I'm going to do. And I seen my mom stay. You know, until she died mm-hmm. and she ended up dying when she was 33 years old. Mm-hmm. So I see my mom stay with my dad for those 33 years, or, you know, all of her life. And, and I think that might've been the only man that she had been with actually mm-hmm. um, was my father. So I seen her stay. And so I knew that that was something I did want to model. I did want to be with someone and stay with them. So we get married and uh, we have a um, beautiful wedding and um, huge, pretty huge wedding. And I lose myself. Mm -mm. I lost myself. I completely lost my personal identity. Yes. So what took place was you know, I'm gathering information and learning about being a wife and, you know, the church, the pillar pillars that we emphasize at that church mm-hmm. was faith, family, and finance. And so it's this dream come true to be a wife, <laughs> to dream, to dream. Right. So I am very myself. It's a fairy tale. I engulf myself in this dream and I lose myself. And I say that I lose myself because I couldn't tell you at that time, um, the first three years of my marriage, what I liked, Mm -hmm. what I, um, what my passion was, what my goals were, who I was as an individual. Mm -hmm. It was, I'm a wife. And I was excited about the idea of being a wife, but how dangerous it was for me to lose who God had called me to be. Yes. So I went into a depression. Mm. I want to talk about that for a second when it comes to losing ourself. Yeah. Um, and I, I hear this all the time. Now I've, I have been single in my life more than I've been married. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I know that feeling of getting married and when I got divorced specific, specifically, good Lord, this last time I remember waking up one day and just asking myself, who are you? Because like you said, I didn't even know what I liked anymore. I had poured so much into my marriage and supporting him and his dreams and, you know, his goals and all these things that I literally didn't know what I liked anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I don't know if that's because of the examples of our moms, right. Of seeing them give so much. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's partially the church. I was raised in the church Mm -hmm. and in the church women, you know, you supported men, you supported the pastor and the deacons and, and you support, support, support. But I didn't hear a lot about who are you as an individual? Like I hear a lot about it as when you're single, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. When it's like, when you're single, you're supposed to know yourself and you're supposed to be whole and then you get married and it's like, well, what, what happened to me? Right. Right. (laughs) So you're now at this place of depression. Mm -hmm. What does that look like for you? Mm. It looked like the, the physical part of it was I was in a mental institution. Mm. That's the physical part of it. Um, But what took place just emotionally was I was just emotionally unhealthy Mm. and man, we know about being physically unhealthy. We sometimes we can see the manifestation of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And not just necessarily in the weight gain, but we can see physically like if a person just has a hard time and they are, you know, five, eight and 125 pounds and they have a hard time going up the stairs right? So they're not overweight on the outside, but still they can be mm-hmm. physically unhealthy. So that's what it was, you know, in, inside April, it was, I was emotionally unhealthy and what was happening on the inside was truly manifesting on the outside. Wow. Like, seriously. Um, I didn't have control of my thoughts, my feelings. Thank God I had control of my behaviors. You know, I right. wasn't you know, um, doing anything that was really irrational. But when issues came up in my life, I didn't know how to cope with the challenges. I didn't know how to cope with life's challenges. And what it was, was that I I had wife Lakeisha, and then I had this other side of being the real Lakeisha. Yeah. What we can say, right? And I, I knew I could be both, mm-hmm. but I didn't know if it would be accepted. Mm, that's right? Good. Yeah. So um, it was all really just taking a risk, being vulnerable, that I ended up launching out to say, okay, I need some help, right? I need to be able to um, be the authentic me, like, I think we we will talk about that word. We'll utilize that word so much. Mm -hmm. And yet, I don't know if many of us, especially as women, I'm sure men too, but we're talking about women today, have really reached like, who am I? Right. Who, what, what do I have a passion for? What do I want to do? What do I want to accomplish? Who do I want to impact? You know, how do I want to pour out? What does that look like? Mm-hmm. But really being authentic to, you know, I really don't like that idea or I don't really like, you know, being around that particular person and the way they make me feel, you know, the energy or whatever. Like really being authentic to your ideas, mm-hmm. you know, your convictions, what you believe, that took me some time mm. because I want to be liked. Yes, yes. You know, I, I want to be accepted. You. I want to ask you a question. So hindsight being 2020, you can now verbalize what was happening, right? Yeah. What was your husband's response in this season of Mm -hmm. you being like, look, I don't know who I am. Like you said, mentally, I'm not sure where I'm at. What was, and, and y'all, if you, you've never met her husband, if you see him on Facebook, Siobhan, he is the coolest, funniest, (laughs) goofiest guy you ever meet, but cool guy. But what was... What was he, his response during this season? Yeah, that is a good question. And April, that is 
grappling why we are at a place that we are now with having a real good marriage is because he covered me. Mm. He absolutely covered me. He supported me, um, still does. He didn't throw it up in my face that like, you crazy, you in a mental institution? Something wrong with your tail, you crazy. Like he, he protected me emotionally. Um, you know, we know that the word talks about washing, a husband is supposed to wash his wife with the word. And that's really what he did. And what that looked like in the natural was him praying over me, him, you know, speaking life over me, him giving me space, um, having conversation, supporting me. Like there was not one time that he ever threw it up in my face to be like, like be crazy or even just in between that time like you know well, questioning my um, my beliefs or um, how I was walking out being a Christian like never ever has he I and mean, he was a, a friend mm. so he didn't just stay in the role of being a husband like okay well this is what my husband duty is supposed to be he was a friend right you know and that's um that's why we are able to walk out what we're able to walk out in this season because through, I mean, sometimes, a lot of times, it's the emotional battles that can really destroy a marriage, yeah. right? You know, Absolutely. something like that, you know, I mean, for real, that can end a marriage. Like, you know, my wife has to be on medication or a mm-hmm. husband has to uh, be dealing with some type of addiction or whatever. Those are marriage killers. Yes. You know, and yes. with this situation, you know, being in a mental institution, that could have been a marriage killer. Absolutely. Could have been. Absolutely. Definitely. Could have been. And when we um when we think about, and you mentioned this earlier, we think about when um something is hurting us. I'll just put it that way, right? Yeah. yeah. Physically, when we have an illness or an ailment it can be very um, easy to notice, right? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. we're so quick to go to the doctor to say, I need help because my arm is broken or I need a pill because, you know, I've got this this issue. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, and particularly I think in the black and brown communities, we put this stigmatism around getting mental help. Yeah. And it's this, it's like, if you would go to the doctor because you had cancer and you wouldn't be ashamed of saying, I need whatever it takes to get healed. Yeah. yeah. Why do we have such a struggle when it comes to our mental, mental health of saying, I'll, I need whatever it takes to get healed. And so when you say things like I was in a mental institution, you know, some people would look at that like, oh, you're weak or you couldn't make it, or, you know, how dare you? But at the end of the day, it's no different than asking your doctor for help from a physical ailment that is affecting you. That's so good. That's, that's it. Yeah. And I know for me, just going through um, the mental roller coaster that I went through in different relationships, I had to get to the place where I was like, okay, I need something Um, And I'm not going to say stronger. I need something on top of my prayers and on top of my family and on top of rest. Mm -hmm. And I need a professional help. Yes. But we as women have to be be able to accept the fact that there are just areas that we're going to need help in. And one of those is our mental health. Yeah. So what was like this aha moment for you? You're like, okay, something is broken, something ain't working. What yeah. was an aha moment that made you say, all right, something's got to change. Like this needs to be different. You know, it was a collective of moments. I would definitely say that looking up and realizing I'm in a whole mental institution. Mm. That's the aha moment. Like, right. whoa, you know, <laughs> like I only read about this. I don't know anybody who's actually gone through this. Mm-hmm. I don't, and, if, and if they have, they didn't tell me, right. I don't know anyone personally. So that was definitely one of the moments for me. Like, I remember being there and um, just crying out. It's like, yeah. I, I knew, like I had not really gone like loco crazy. Right. I hadn't gone loco crazy. Thank God. And 
<laughs> I remember crying and uh, being while I was there and was just like, God, how do you want to use me? Mm. How, what do you want to do with me? Mm. Right. I didn't have the thoughts of like actually committing suicide. Right. But because I actually said I'm hopeless, um, I couldn't think of like things about the future. Um, and I had a three month old mm. at the time. They were the doctors was like, you got to go. Yeah. So um, when you start talking about you don't see a future for yourself and mm. you are hopeless, um, at least all those years ago, it definitely triggered for them to say, oh, you know, she's crying un- uncontrollably and we got to get her some help. And I'm mm. thankful for it. But it was in those moments in, in, when I was actually at the institution that I was crying out and was like, what do you want to do with me? Um, you know, am, am I... Should, should I leave my husband and my kids and go live another life because I'm not good enough for them? You know, I had started mentally like thinking about that and, you know, planning for that. Um, but then it was a, no, no daughter. This is the life that I have for you. Mm. This is where I want you to be. And out of this pain, some unhealed pain from childhood, being disappointed about, I mean, my mom dying of breast cancer when I was 16, so many things already. While I'm even in that institution, I'm thinking like, she's missed out on so much. I had graduated from high school. I had um, gotten married um, at that time, had had two children and was a, a bonus mom to a little boy. Um, I already had some great things, leadership role at the church, leadership role, even in the community. I already started these wonderful things that I was like, oh man, I'm broken because I wanted my mom to have that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, I wanted to experience those things with my mom and just really upset about that alone. And then on top of that, not having a healthy, emotionally, uh, emotionally healthy father, Right. So he's living, but he's not really, uh, you know, really, he's not emotionally healthy. So I'm like, here I am feeling like a bastard child out here mm-hmm. and it's not there. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's not. So I was dealing with a whole bunch of pain from childhood. And um, at the time, like Shabbat, his family was pretty, pretty whole in the sense of, um, you know, his mom and dad have been married for years. Um, both, you know, in his life, and it wasn't a jealousy, but it was like that's exactly what I deserve. Yeah. And so it was highlighting for me as well as to the pain and the deficiency that I felt that I had mm-hmm. not having the, the a good healthy home because right. most of the time, most of the time, when we look at healthy, emotionally healthy adults, most of the time it's because they had an emotionally healthy home, whether it was a parent, whether it was a grandma, whether it was a foster home, whatever, they are the product typically of where they came from. Absolutely. Absolutely. So my aha, my aha moment, you know, really defining that I needed to get emotionally healthy too was at that point, you know, really that was in 2005. 2005 that um, I was like, I I have to make a decision. And whatever decision that I make, I know it's going to be my decision. I can't blame it on my parents and what Mm -hmm. they didn't do. I can't blame it on my husband and who I wanted him to show up for me as. Um, I can't blame it on my aunt or anyone else. So I get to make this decision. And really being in that position allowed me to, I mean, talk about being at your lowest. And that's where God totally picked me up and carried me. And was like, I got you. Lean into me. Trust me. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have any, like, one else to lean into. I didn't yeah. have anything else to trust in. So it was, you got to do this. <laughs> and um, if you do this, I'll carry you, Lakeisha. That is so good. Um, I'm glad that you talked about making the decision. Um, I think in so many cases we may feel like, and we've heard this, right? I don't have a choice. 
Yeah. Well, you do have a choice. <laughs> now, one choice may be easier than the other, mm -hmm. but you have a choice. And going back to what you said earlier about one of the things that you knew you wanted to model after your mother was her staying power, right? Yes. In yes. Her marriage. And so yes. during this season, you had a choice. You, like you said, you could have said, I'm out. Yes. Um, kids, I'll see you when I see you. Yes. And I'm going to go start this e seemingly easier life, right? Yeah. By myself. But you had a decision. You had to make a choice. Um, one of the things that I talk about when I coach women is that you own your healing. Yes. You own your yes. healing. And yes. part of owning your healing is that you make the decision to walk out your healing. Now, whatever that journey may look like, because I'm sure it wasn't like, okay, I'm going to decide to stay in my marriage. Now everything is rainbows and roses. No, right. it was, I have to make this decision and now I've got to walk that out. So you made the decision to stay. Yes. I'm going to yeah. go back to my family yeah. and I'm going to do what it takes to, um, to have a happy life. What did that look like maybe those next few years with you and your marriage to kind of get onto the road that you guys are on now? I asked for help, more help. <laughs> I kept asking for help, girl. You can't do it by yourself. Mm -mm. You can't. I think that's such a, a trick of the enemy to have us set up to thinking that, okay, you can do this by yourself. The less people that you share with, then the better for you, right? Because they won't know your business. They won't know... Um, they won't be able to talk about you or whatever. And I really just debunked that whole idea of, um, you know, keeping things a secret and not asking for help because, you know, if Siobhan and I weren't to make it and got a divorce, but what would people say? They didn't make it and they got a divorce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, right? And so it's like, you know, I'm going to, I would rather have them say, you know, she needed to reach out or she had to reach out and ask for help versus that. I wanted to be able to create the narrative for my own story. Mm -hmm. And I knew that asking for help was going to create that, that give me more options um, yes. for myself. And um, I think it's also Satan to have us thinking that we don't have options. We don't have choices, right? right? Because when we feel as though we don't have those options, then that's when we start to make some bad decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, okay, I know that I have options because I have a relationship with Christ. Yes. And yes. Um, getting a, a good support system. So I got support um, in person and online. That was really when online started to really push in the 2005, six, seven, mm -hmm. eight, the, that time frame. I think MySpace had maybe even came out um, at that time, but uh, I made sure to get that support. You know, I had women who were online who stretched me and challenged me. And I wanted some women who didn't know me personally, mm -hmm. right, to be able to give me that, uh, that wheel. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't just trying to go to friends. I wanted right. women who didn't know Lakeisha and um, her smile right. and her bubbly personality. You know, I wanted to be able to come and say, although I am smiling, I'm still not happy. Yeah. You know, I want to have someone to be able to look at me and say, you're yeah, beautiful teeth, girl. Oh, you're so lovely. But you're in pain. Mm -hmm. you're, in, you're suffering. And it's for your own, it's your own suffering. It's not necessarily someone else has even caused it, but you're, you have gotten used to being in that place of mm. suffering and fear. I was living in so much fear with my dad because of, being an alcoholic, I didn't know what we were going to get. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what. Each day, it was something different, April. So it was always a thing of where I was just living in fear. And I grew accustomed to that. That became that feeling of anxiousness and anxiety. I married it. Got very comfortable yes. with it, right? Um, but I had these, you know, women to challenge me. And, um, you know, I, I remember uh, one of them asking me, um, you know, Keisha, do you want to grow mentally and emotionally? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, what kind of question is that? And she said to me, you have to do the work. I had never yes. heard of it. I, I never heard of that phrase. 
So I know like when you go exercise, April, like, you know, right, that's you doing right. the work, you can do the work, right? But I'm like, what does that mean mm-hmm. for me to have to do the work, right? And she ended up saying to me, like, um, when you start to do the work, you'll see, you'll see things happening in your life. And I was like, okay. And she was like, success leaves clues. And I was like, okay. Like she's throwing out all these like great phrases that I had no idea what she meant. And, you know, she started breaking some things down to me, but, you know, she was saying like success is not based on luck or chance or environment, you know, like highly successful individuals have patterns and systems that design them to produce successful outcomes. She's like, you want success in your life, Rakesha? You know, she's like, you can move from high potential to high achieving at work. You know, when you identify these patterns and find the clues that, you know, that are happening in people who are successful, you know, and I was like, really? So she, she just really like sparked this, interest in another aha moment for me um, when she started speaking those phrases over my life and um, I wanted to know more and so I started being interested in the character of a person who was successful Mm. in their marriage right character of a person who was successful in the community these things that I wanted and um, in the character of a person who walked out their healing for real Right. Right. Like, what did they do? And I gravitated toward these people who had some similar stories as myself and started growing and learning and communicating and opening up and healing came, new connections and relationships came. And 20 years later, different. Wow. I mean, totally different, April. Wow. Wow. Um, I love how you talked about doing the work. Um, I remember that aha moment for me, I was out taking a walk. Um, and this was after my, my last divorce. And I was just like, God, this isn't fair. Like, you know, I did what I was supposed to do. And, you know, we went to counseling and we did all these things. This isn't fair. And clear as day, I heard God say, life ain't fair. Get over it. And I was like, wait, what? Wow. Wow. He was like, what yeah. you going to do? Yeah. Like life ain't fair. What are you going to do? And it was in that moment of making that decision to do mm-hmm. the work, right? Yeah. There's yeah. a book that I'm reading right now by um, Dr. Henry Cloud, which is probably like my favorite author in the whole widest yeah. world. Yeah. Um, but it's called nine things you, you simply need to do to succeed in love and life. Oh, yes. Is that yes. new? Is that new? I don't think it's no. new. I've just okay. kind of working my way down his list. Yeah. Um, but that one really hit home in doing the work. And there was a lady okay. that he counseled who um, she was in a relationship and she was like, well, you know, this guy isn't going to change, you know, should I leave him? And he was like, you got a choice to make. You can oh. stay and accept the relationship you have or you can leave. And sometimes we get so comfortable with the dysfunction. I remember when I started dating two years ago and I would meet like these really great guys Mm -hmm. and this fear would strike up in me and I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And what it was, was that I was so used to the guy that didn't show up. I was so used to the guy that didn't come through. I was so used to the guy that was going to be late. that didn't do what he said he was going to do. When I was meeting men who did these things, it literally was foreign to me. It was, it was uncomfortable for me. And I couldn't figure out why. And I remember praying one night and I was like, God, like, why, why do I feel this fear? Mm -hmm. And God, you're, you have been, you've become so comfortable with dysfunction that when you have someone who generally cares and has good character, you are afraid of that. Like how crazy is that? Wow. (laughs) And that, because that's what I saw growing up was dysfunctional. So I could deal with the guy that lied. I could deal with the guy that cheated. I could deal with the guy who was late, who didn't do what he said. Like I was prepared for all that, but the one that showed up like, wait, what what do I do? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That was part of doing the work yeah. was being able to work through my own 
history of emotions yes. and things that I was conditioned for in order to have a successful relationship. Yeah. So I want to ask you, I'm going to ask you two questions. First, um, what is it that you do today, um, you and your husband, that helped you guys or keeps you guys from kind of going back to where you were 2005, 2008? Do you go to conferences? Do you pray? Do you know, what are the things yeah. that you guys do to keep your marriage strong so you don't go back to what it yeah. used to be or you yeah. don't go back to who you used yeah. to be? Yeah. Um, one of the doing the works things that I've had to walk out is to really gain control after a failure. Um, because I'm a risk taker just in general by, by nature, that's my, part of my personality, I would feel that some of the risk, that thing, risky things that I was doing um, would be a flop or a failure. Um, and not a whole lot, but you know, just having one can be a blow, <laughs> you yeah. know? So gaining control after a failure and having that as a part of my model and makeup that failure will happen, but not to allow it to paralyze me has been one of the, the reasons and ways for me as an individual, but even him and I to continue to grow together. Because a lot of times when you have a failure and you're in marriage, you're pointing the finger, you're blaming. Yeah. You're going to blame like, oh, we can't pay the rent this month. Well, what you do with the money? Oh, it's because you weren't working or whatever, right? Or oh, it's, you know, it's a breach in our relationship emotionally. It's because you ain't speaking my love language. It's because mm -hmm. you ain't, you know, giving me what I need, right? So really learning how to gain control after a failure because those are going to happen. You are going to have some moments where you feel like you have failed. And if you don't gain control quickly, then you're going to be paralyzed. I think another thing for me personally was really finding meaning in loss and trauma because of how my childhood really affected me, knowing how to have, to find that meaning, then that's how I'm able to pour out, you know, and you know, do things. We, did, we just did a, a wonderful citywide baby shower, you know, and that came from, man, like I had dealt with, not necessarily personally, but I felt the embarrassment of, um, in, in shame of having a baby out of wedlock, having a child um, at 19 years old and had a full ride scholarship and had to drop out. Like just a whole emotional mess that I was going through. So finding the meaning in loss and trauma and then really nurturing my self-esteem. Gosh, can't look, you can't look to no man. You cannot look to your husband to do that. Mm. Okay, you cannot. You know, you know, like, cause our self-esteem, well, you know, it'll fluctuate some days when we feel better. I told you what I got going on this week, you know, where I'm like, oh my gosh, um, you know, we can become really self-critical of ourselves and, you know, we have an emotional immune system, you know, that needs to be nurtured back to health when it's, you know, it's, you know ailing and, you know, failing and whatever. So really having those things um, in place and not putting that, making that be my spouse's responsibility yes. to nurture my self-esteem, not making it be my spouse's responsibility to find meaning in my trauma and loss, right? Not making it my spouse's responsibility to help me to gain, you know, some control after I feel like I have had a failure. Now, here's the deal, in a healthy marriage, they should help walk you through that, right? And they maybe may even initiate it, but it's still our own individual journey. And that is what has made our marriage beautiful. I love it. I love it. Those are some great tips. And those are tips that um, you guys can walk out with each other forever. Those yeah. are great tips. Yeah. So the second thing I want to ask you about is you guys do a marriage retreat me too. Um, so I love how you are taking the things that you guys have learned over the years and you're yeah. pouring back into other marriages. Um, tell me a little bit about how that came about. Yeah. Um, how did you guys decide, you know what, we're going to help other, other couples to succeed. <laughs> 
because of the story you just heard, girl. <laughs> <laughs> We got to help couples because, oh my gosh, we did all the things, April. We went to marriage counseling, our church being full of the pillars of the family, faith, and finance. They had us go through some pretty intensive um, uh, premarital counseling. That was really great, right? Um, But we knew that we still, it was some loopholes. It's always some loopholes. I guess there were some really big loopholes. And after you went through premarital counseling and you walked down the aisle, had your beautiful wedding, zip, you were on your own. Mm -hmm. You were on your own as a couple. And it was like, but this is where we really need help because now we're really trying to walk out being married. And we had a manual for how to be with courtship. We had a manual. The church gave us a manual. So we knew how to act. We knew what to do, right? We knew like it was questions and answers in there. Oh, we got this conflict. Oh, we know how to deal with it. But we didn't have that for marriage. And we were feeling isolated and by ourselves when things were coming up. Oh my gosh, like really by ourselves. And so it was like quickly, you know, I knew I was like, okay, I need to, this is an outlet. This is something that God is call, calling us to do. Now, Shabbat was more, he's more introvert. So okay. he's kind of like, yeah, I see the need, but I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> like, oh, no, no, no. So then it was like, okay. Well, maybe we can just do like one event, right? And just see what happens, you know? So yeah. I convinced him to, to do one event. And he was ready to share, you know, he's full of the word and he's a minister. And so he was ready to pour out and, and share and teach, um, but not necessarily specifically in that area alone, right? Um, so we, we took a leap. Yeah, we just took a leap. And when we were in Ohio, it was, let's do a love event. Let's just go ahead and do a love event. And the love event sold out. Wow. It sold out. Like, it was like, oh, people really want this. Yeah. Because, right? you know, although we have a little bit of influence, still, you know, that don't matter. People are mm-hmm. like, I mean, that that's, it matters a little bit. But in general, overall, if it's not something that I need then I'm not going to sign up to go to. Right. So people were like, we, we need to know about some love. Individually, self-love, but then even in our relationships. And so that mm-hmm. event sold out. And as soon as that sold out, April, God had called us to move out here. And wow. in that transition, um, literally, while we were relocating out here physically, God was speaking to us about having a marriage retreat. And I was like, well, Lord, we don't know any married couples there (laughs) in Arizona. We know married couples in Ohio. We don't know any married couples there. And it's been explosive ever since. It really has. It has not been tedious or hard. Now, events in general take a lot of work. They do. Take a lot of work. So that's one reason why we only have it once a year. (laughs) Right. Um, God has, I, you know, we told God probably by year three, we can't keep doing it without a team, send mm-hmm. some people. And he was like, well, now that you ask, here you go. Here's some right. people, you know, you know, you didn't ask, you was trying to do it on your own, you know, in your own strength and do everything Lakeisha. Um, but now that you've asked for some people, here's some people. So it has been life changing for us, which is one of the reasons why we continue to do it. Um, that's a secret <laughs> that right. we, we get blessed um, mm-hmm. because we get fed, you know, and the biggest thing there is the community. It is a, yes. it's a big, small group um, that we believe that we're going to keep it at the capacity that it's at, which is about that 40 to 50 couples. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so wonderful to, to see married couples hook up with other married couples that are now in business together, April. They're now writing books together. They're nice. traveling together. And that is part of the heartbeat of being able to have a good, healthy marriage is who you're surrounding yourself with, that community. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank you. That is exciting. That yes. is um, what I like to say, you're using your pain to fuel your purpose. Absolutely. And I love it. Yes. I love it. 
Well, Lakeisha, thank you so much, so, so much for chatting with me today. Thank you for your authenticity. Thank you for your laughter. Um, Thank you for the nuggets that you dropped. You know, I just pray that by talking to you, that there are other women out there that will hear this story that maybe where you were in 2005, who may feel like, you know what, I'm lost. I don't know how to get out of this. And because of listening to your story, it will give them the tools and the hope and the nuggets that they need to move their finish line. So thank you, Lakeisha. Thank you. My pleasure. Awesome. Well, everyone who's listening, thank you again for listening to this latest episode of Move the Finish Line. Get out there, listen to some of the other previous episodes if you haven't already. We're talking about health, we're talking about finances, we're talking about motherhood, we're talking about all those areas in our lives where, that we run our races. And my prayer is that through listening to this podcast, you guys will move your finish line. All right, y'all. Now, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I pray that it encourages you and you were able to laugh a little bit along the way. Now, if you know someone who has a story of resilience, restoration, and winning at life, let me know. I would love to share their story with my audience. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you guys don't miss a beat. If you want to connect with me, hop over to aprilnallen.com where you can learn all about how I help women to cultivate their purpose so they can impact more people. You can connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and Clubhouse under April Nallen. Thanks again for listening.